Hi, this is Brian Forster coming to you from Paracas in Peru. This is part six of a seven part YouTube series about the elongated skull DNA uh, research of Paracas in Peru. And this part is about the team of people who were involved in this process. There were ten important people involved and I wish to give a brief description of each and what their role was. Of course, I was the coordinator in Peru itself. Um, I've been studying the elongated skulls of Paracas for about 10 years, and so I was the one coordinating between <coughs> the um, Ministry of Culture, specifically uh, Ruben Garcia Soto, who is a leading archeologist for the Ministry of Culture in Ica, Peru, and making local um, organizational things like transport, etc., hotels, etc. And I did this along with the vital assistance of my wife, Irene. And then in the United States, the main coordinator by far was Dr. Ellie Marzulli. Uh, Ellie made several trips down, sometimes with team members, uh, sometimes with simply one camera person. And uh, if he was not involved, there's no way this process would have reached its climax, which it has now. He was responsible for coordinating with the two DNA labs located in North America. Um, also, he was able to get the $100,000 which was utilized and required in order to be able to do the proper DNA testing in two of the 10 top DNA laboratories in the world. He did this uh, as well with Mondo Gonzalez, who is an American archaeologist. Uh, Mondo wrote up the report at the end. He was involved in the, the sampling uh, here in Peru, both at the Ica Museum and the Senior Juan Navarro Museum in Paracas. So Mondo was a very vital person to have. Then we also had Chase Klosky, who was responsible for making sure that the environments, both at the Ica Museum and also the Paracas Museum of Senior Juan, were as sterile as possible. Uh, she was the one who took the samples as soon as they were uh, removed from the skulls and put them into perfect sterile packages, labeled them, packaged them, and brought them to the United States. So without Chase's help, uh, we would get a lot of accusations of contamination. But both laboratories said that the work Chase did was superior to what was required. So hats off to her. Then we also had Richard Shaw, who documented the entire process. He came down multiple times, sometimes just with L.A. Marzulli, uh, sometimes with the team. He recorded all of the DNA sampling, the locations such as the Chongo Cemetery, and other places as well. So without his documentation, uh, we wouldn't have the full evidence. So Richard did a brilliant job. And also then Dr. Malcolm Warren, an American chiropractor, uh, Dr. Michael Alday, a uh, medical physician in the United States, uh, 35 years of experience, and Rick Woodward, who is an anthropologist in the United States. The three of them were mainly studying the um, abnormalities or differences of the elongated skulls of Paracas, Peru, as compared to normal skulls and also other skulls uh, of other cultural groups of this area. And they were able to figure out um, that the lack of the uh, sagittal suture here um, is a probably a genetic abnormality, um, not the, the idea that it was um, prematurely uh, closed or calcified. It seemed to simply not be there according to them. Um, also the eye sockets appear to be larger than normal and the <clears throat> form and magnum, which again is where your spinal column uh, enters the bottom of your skull, the position of it is much farther back than is normal. And so all three were able to figure out that there's no way that the movement of the foramen magnum backwards like that could be the result of cranial deformation. It has to be genetic. Also, the opening of the foramen magnum appears to be oval and not round as it is in Homo sapiens sapiens. And that's another abnormality. 
And I believe all three con uh, concluded that the necks of the Paracas elongated skulls would be longer and thinner than normal. So those are the factors that uh, they figured out. And also, of course, um, Ruben, the archaeologist in uh, Peru, in Ica, was vital because we had to do this with the Peruvian Ministry of Culture. There was no way uh, that we could take even little powdered samples of Paracas material outside of Peru for testing without the approval of the Ministry of Culture of Peru. And without Ruben's assistance, that would have been almost impossible. So my personal thanks to the other nine members of this group that worked together very well. Um, and hats off to all of them for their expertise. Now in part seven, what I'm going to do is get into a more detailed discussion of the actual DNA haplogroups that were found because many of them were not indigenous to the Americas uh, and were not present supposedly in South America um, technically before the first Spanish arrived in the 1500s. So this means that 2,000 plus years ago, there were people called the Paracas, a very complex uh, DNA background that were living on the coast of Peru. I'll also discuss um, blood type samples that were taken and uh, supposedly prior to the arrival of the Europeans in the 16th century, all native people, especially of Peru and South America in general, were supposed to be 100% blood type O, and this is not the case. So I'll get into that in the final uh, seventh chapter of this series. Thank you so much for your interest.